Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pendika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Monks, when a cow herd possesses eleven factors, he is incapable of keeping and rearing a, a herd of cattle. What eleven? When a cow herd has no knowledge of form, he is unskilled in the characteristics. He fails to pick out the fly's eggs. He fails to dress wounds. He fails to smoke out the sheds. He does not know the ford. That's a stream in places where they can get across. He does not know what it is, what it is to have drunk. He does not know the road. He's unskilled in pastures. He milks dry. And he shows no extra veneration to those bulls who are fathers and leaders of the herd. When a cow herd possesses these eleven qualities or factors, he is incapable of keeping and rearing a herd, a, cat, a herd of cattle. <coughs> so too, when a monk possessing, possesses eleven qualities, he is incapable of growth, increase, and fulfillment in this dhamma and discipline. What eleven? Here a monk has no knowledge of form. <coughs> He's unskilled in characteristics. He fails to pick out flies' eggs. He fails to dress wounds. He fails to smoke out the herds. Smoking out the herds basically means correcting what's been incorrectly given. He does not know the ford. He does not know what it is to have drunk. He does not know the road. He is unskilled in pastures. He milks dry and he shows no extra veneration to those monks, elder monks, of long standing who have long gone forth, the fathers and leaders of the Sangha. How has a monk no knowledge of form? Here a monk does not understand as it actually is thus. All material form whatever, whatever kind, consists of the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. That is how a monk has no knowledge of form how is a monk unskilled in characteristics? Here, a monk does not understand as it actually is. Thus, a fool is characterized by his actions. A wise man is characterized by his actions. That is how a monk is unskilled in characteristics. How does a monk fail to pick out flies' eggs? Here, when a thought of sensual desire has arisen, a monk tolerates it. He does not abandon it and remove it. So it's like He's noting it until it supposedly goes away. And annihilates it. When a thought of Ill will, Ill will has arisen, or a thought of cruelty has arisen, 
when evil and wholesome states have arisen, a monk tolerates them. He does not abandon them, remove them, and do away with them. So what are we talking about here? He's not using right effort in the correct way. He's not using the six R's. That is how a monk fails to pick up fly, to fails to pick out flies eggs. Now we're talking about the hindrances here. Now you've already had a, a discourse on the hindrances and how important it is not to get involved in the hindrances, not to get caught up in it. Don't make a big deal out of anything that pulls your attention away. Let it be, relax, smile, lighten your mind, come back to your object of meditation, stay with your object of meditation. Here, on seeing a form with the eye, a monk grasps at its signs and features. He starts thinking about the signs and features and how he likes them or dislikes them. And then it has another thought and another thought and it just pulls him away and he doesn't even recognize it. Even though he leaves the eye faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief, I like it, I don't like it. In other words, it's allowing craving to arise and might invade him and he does not practice the way of its restraint. He does not guard the eye faculty, not undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. <clears throat> when I was in Burma, they, um, they have a system, because they have so much rain that they have these little things that the, the water can go in and flow away. And there was a monk that decided that he was going to do his meditation with his eyes closed. He didn't want to, he wanted to have restraint of the eye faculty, that's what he was thinking. And of course, he hit one of these ditches, as it were, and broke his leg because he was being foolish. He wasn't doing it in the correct way. On hearing a sound with the ear, if you make a big deal out of sound, I don't like that. It's stopping me from meditating. It's causing me to be disturbed. Well, uh, the last retreat we had, that's one of the first things somebody said, can they stop working on the cabins and making so much noise during the retreat? I said, no, they can't do that. You have to change your perspective. You have to not make a big deal out of it in your mind. You have to allow that to be there. It's only a sound. It's not good, it's not bad. It's just a sound. But when you make a big deal out of it, all of a sudden that sound turns into a problem for you and it causes you to not see the uh, the craving as it begins to arise. And it distracts you away. It stops you from staying with your object of meditation. And the same with the smell of, uh, with the nose and tasting flavor with the tongue and touching a tangible with the body or cognizing a mind object with mind. If he grasps at its signs and features, even though he leaves the mind, fac these sense door faculties unguarded, evil unwholesome states, 
of I want it and I don't want it arise and might invade him. So making a big deal out of hindrances, not liking them, trying to force them to stop and to go away is making a big deal out of it. And when you make a big deal out of it, when you become obsessed with it, you're causing yourself immeasurable amounts of pain. So you need to allow it to be. It's only what it is. It's only what's in the present moment. It doesn't matter whether it's a smell or taste or touch or thought. Your job <coughs> is to develop your mindfulness. This is a word that has a lot of different meanings this day. And it's not very well understood. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. When you see it first start to move, if you use the six R's right then, your mind will not be distracted for very long. But if you forget, now you're going to be distracted for longer. Now you remember that hindrances are not your enemy to fight with. You're not trying to control things. You're not trying to make things be the way you want them to be. Your job is just to observe and let it be there by itself. Why? Because that's the truth. Anytime you try to fight with the truth or control it or make it be the way you want, that's the cause of suffering. I don't care if it's a feeling. I don't care if it's emotion. I don't care what the cause is. Your job is to observe that it's there let it be there. Don't keep your attention on it. Okay, it's a sound. So, one of the things that I noticed that happened when I was practicing so much straight vipassana was that somebody would make a sound and it would boink me. It, it would make, make my mind Oh, and why did that happen? Because your concentration is too deep and your mindfulness is not in balance with it. If your mindfulness in, is in balance, it doesn't matter what kind of sound there is. You just let it be there by itself. Relax, let go of that I like it or I don't like it mind, the craving. Let it be by itself. Smile. The more you smile all the time, the better your mindfulness becomes. And you start progressing in your meditation more and better because your mindfulness gets sharper and you start seeing things more easily. Now the thing that happens quite a bit, especially at the start of the meditation, is people don't like that sort of thing. I don't like that sound. I don't want that sound there. I don't like that thought. Why is my mind doing this? Now you're becoming obsessed with it and you're further and further away from staying with your spiritual friend and smiling. So don't criticize yourself. Don't think that you're supposed to be better than you are because you're as good as you are. 
it gets easier as you become more familiar with this process. But criticizing yourself is an unwholesome state. Let go of the expectation that you're supposed to be this way or that way. Because it's going to change. Everything is in a state of change. Some days your meditation is going to be great. Some days it's going to be not so great. What people call great meditation, they're staying with their object of meditation and their mind becomes real calm and peaceful and all of these wonderful things are happening. People call that good meditation. And then they have a day when their minds are just running all over the place. My definition of good meditation is seeing it, using the six R's, not trying to control anything. And even though your mind is active, it means that you have to work because you're seeing all of this. Now an interesting thing with meditation that is not talked about very much and that is learn to use your intuition. You ask yourself, why, why is my mind so active today? What's the cause of this? After you ask that question just one time, go back to doing the meditation the way you were, your intuition will tell you what the problem is. And then you'll know how to solve it. You say, yeah, I, I have been attached and thinking about this. But you hadn't noticed it so well. But when you have an active meditation, that's when I say that's your best meditation, not your worst. When you have the good meditation day, that's your candy. That's because you did a lot of work before that and now your mind is starting to actually see that. So you call it good meditation. But I call it Eh, nothing to get excited about. It's okay meditation, but you're eating the candy, all the work that you've done before. When you have to do a lot of work, now that's what I call good meditation, because it improves your mindfulness when you have to use the six R's a lot. But also you can find out the cause of that. <clears throat> Ask yourself, what, why is this happening? What's the cause of this? Then forget about it. Don't ask it again. Don't try to force an answer. It will come when it's convenient for it to come. When you're ready to listen to it. But then you can adjust your sitting and you say, oh yeah, that's, that's really why. Trust your intuition. It's always correct. One of the things with intuition is it's a quiet voice. It's not a big voice that comes into your mind. And you'll have a tendency to go, yeah, that's it, that, that's happening, but never mind. I'm just going to keep going the way I am. And if you don't pay attention to your intuition before long, it will stop coming up and then you really have some problems. So you want to use your intuition anytime something is happening and you don't understand it. What is the cause of that? When you really trust your intuition, it will give you the correct answer. Get in the habit of using the intuition. The more you use it, the faster the answers come and the easier everything in life becomes. 
Now, there are some people that they insist on not paying attention to their intuition, and they say, well, I know what's happening. And they don't really. And that causes a lot of suffering. So don't do that to yourself. Trust your intuition. It's a quiet voice, but it's always correct. Okay, that is how a monk fails to dress the wounds. These things come up and they're, they, they're hurtful. They're painful. They're not going with the way you think your meditation is supposed to be going. And then you start fighting it. And then you start trying to use the six R's too much. And you barely get through the six R's or might not even get through, through them at all before your mind is distracted again. And what, is, what does that cause? That causes the hindrances to get bigger and more intense because you're trying to control them. You don't like them, you're obsessed with them. So you need to back off. You need to laugh at how silly your mind can be. Because it, it really comes up with some wonderful nonsense. <laughs> okay, so it's real important for your progress to learn how to adjust the amount of energy you're using when uh, your mind is needs adjustment and the adjustment with restlessness is always back off don't try so hard let go of your ideas that things are supposed to be the way you want them to be because that doesn't meet reality quite often and then that you start suffering more and more and you cause your own suffering. You can't blame anybody else for it. So, relax into it. Let things unfold as they will. And how does a monk fail to smoke out the sheds? Here a monk does not teach others in detail the Dhamma he has learned and mastered. That is how a monk fails to smoke out the sheds. And I would add in there the correct way of practice. There's a lot of people doing meditation right now and they're not following the Eightfold Path. They're not following the Four Noble Truths. They just kind of say, yeah, that's what these are and that's it. Now I have to get back to the practice. Not realizing that this is the practice. When you practice in the correct way, and that means by following right effort, and that means using the six R's. When you practice in the correct way, you will start to have nice insights in how you cause your own pain and you can let go of it then. And you start to become more happy all the time. And it really does work this way. You're going to fall into your old habits every now and then, but you'll catch it more quickly as you practice this more. You'll see. So this is how you are uh, smoking out the sheds. There are certain kinds of meditation that when it's practiced, it's not that you don't gain benefit from the practice, 
you do. But what's the end result of doing the practice? Are you letting go of the suffering or are you practicing a one-pointed kind of concentration that it actually, the concentration suppresses the hindrances, doesn't allow them to come up. And when it suppresses the hindrances, then your mind gets stuck just on one object, that's it. And you're not seeing the hindrances, so you're not learning how to let go of the hindrances. And when you lose the concentration of sitting in meditation, then the hindrances come and you're not able to recognize them because they've been suppressed, they've been pushed down. So how is there any personality development? Well, I'm supposed to be this way. When I do meditation, I'm supposed to get good sleep and I'm supposed to be more happy, but are you? That's the question. So it's a real interesting phenomena that if you add just one extra step in that practice, and that is relaxing the tension and tightness, it changes the entire meditation. And that's the, the main thing that the Buddha found out. He'd done one-pointed concentration. He tried all different kinds of meditation while he was still a bodhisattva looking for what, what he finally found out, that you have to let go of the craving. That's the cause of the suffering. That's the second noble truth. Now, a lot of people, they call craving, oh, it's just desire, wanting something to happen in a particular way. Well, that's only a surface view of it. When you relax that tension and tightness in your head, right after that, your mind is clear, your mind is very bright, your mind is very alert, and it's pure. Why is it pure? Because you've let go of the craving. Craving is not particularly big and it's not particularly difficult to let go of. But it is very persistent. It keeps coming back over and over and over again so you have to be able to recognize it so you can let it be. And that's the importance of the second step of right effort. Don't make a big deal out of whatever arises. Let it be there by itself, but don't keep your attention on it. Psychology, they want you to follow it and find out why is this coming up. They're never really going to find out. Because it might be ten lifetimes ago that you broke a precept and felt guilty and you kept on trying to push that guilty feeling down. But when you really let go, there's a feeling of openness and expansion in your mind. And your mind tends towards being more alert, happier, uplifted. It really does work this way. What's the cause of the hindrance arising? What is the cause? This is something that you never hear. You hear, uh, I have a booklet in my, in my cabin right now, and it talks about suppressing and pushing down and pushing away and crushing mind with mind. Well, that's the opposite of the Buddha's teaching. Don't keep your attention on it. It's something that happened in, in a past event. 
you broke a precept. And you got a guilty feeling from breaking the precept and then you kind of shine it on and you say, nah, I'm not going to mess with this. And it really does make a difference. This is one of the reasons that people hold on to the one-pointed concentration so much is because the concentration gets deep. They don't have the hindrances and it's, it's, it's they get into a, a state of of bliss, they get into a state of joy because the hindrances are suppressed. But when they come out of that, they have the hindrances, but they can't recognize that they have them. Do you have hindrances arise during the day? Well, everybody does. What do you do with it? If you practice one-pointed concentration, you get caught up in it. You can still have the same amount of anger that you had before you meditated. And then you start questioning, well, why is this, why, why am I not letting go of this? Why, why am I caught up in this still? Meditation is supposed to make you happy, but I'm not happy because I have this anger or sadness or fear or anxiety, whatever the catch of the day is. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what you do with it. If you get back into your one-pointed concentration, you're not letting go of it, you're suppressing it with the concentration. So you have to be able to recognize it, release it by not keeping your attention on it, relaxing the tightness caused by that, and smile. Bring the smiling mind back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. Don't force it. Just let it be by itself you will naturally progress with this meditation. It happens all by itself. You don't have to make anything happen. You have to learn how to let go and let it be and relax and smile and come back. Now one of the things that happens, especially with people as they start, is they try to use the six R's with any kind of thing that comes up in their mind. And <clears throat> you don't need to do that. If your attention is not pulled away from your object of meditation, just let those thoughts be there. They'll disappear on their own. But if you get pulled away, and you're not with your spiritual friend anymore, you're not with your object of meditation, then that's the time you use the six R's. Okay, so don't try to overuse it. And another thing that happens, especially with people that haven't done a whole lot of meditation, is that they will have a real good city. And they'll go, oh yeah, but I, I need to get up and do something. Go to the bathroom or whatever. And then you walk a little bit and you come back and your first thought before you get back is, I'm going to do that again. That was really nice. And that's the last thing that happens. Why? Because I want is in there. I'm trying to control, I'm trying to make it happen because it was such a good sitting. And it doesn't work. Your mind is real restless. So what is a natural thing to do? Well, let's try a little bit harder. So your meditation gets even more active. That's when you need to laugh with yourself. Look at what I'm doing. I don't need to be doing this. 
You just need to be relaxing into it. So stop. Don't do that anymore. Start over again. Let's just allow these things to be there by themselves. Don't make a big deal out of it because you make a big deal out of it when you try to control it. And you'll see that your progress is much faster when you do that. It's, it's much easier when you do that. Whenever I give a retreat, one of the things that I tell people is, first, you gotta smile. All the time, smile, smile, smile. Second, I want you to laugh with yourself when you're caught. Why? Because when you laugh, you're not caught by it anymore. You go from, I am this and it's not working to, well, it's only this. Do I need to carry that around? No, let it go. So that's the fastest way to overcome any hindrance. And I want you to have fun. Now this is a brand new concept in the world of meditation. You mean it's supposed to be fun? Well, I've been to so many retreats, and believe me, I've been to a lot of them over the years. And I've done an awful lot of meditation. And what I found out was that when people are doing one-pointed concentration or noting things too much, that they get real serious with the practice and they don't have fun. And you see a lot of students with these deep lines. They're really trying hard. And of course the trying hard is the thing that makes the meditation worse. So there's not any real progress and the progress you get is very slow. This meditation that I'm showing you, your progress is fast. Everybody here is progressing. And I see it. I don't necessarily talk about it. Because that's a way to build up your pride and uh, I got, I'm in this jhana, you know, I'm something special. I don't talk about that sort of thing because a jhana is misunderstood. The kind of jhana that I'm showing you the jhana is like a signpost. It just, it tells me where you are in the meditation so I can talk to you in a different way about what you're doing. Okay, it's, it's a level of your understanding. Now this whole meditation is about understanding, but you have to teach yourself this. And when you go from one jhana to the next, that shows me that you're, you're doing it correctly. You're doing it just right, continue. It's not gonna be the same all the time. It's gonna be changing, everything is changing. So it's okay if it's, sometimes it's a little more difficult than others. Well, if it's a little more difficult, that means you have to work a little harder and stay with the six R's and it will fade away and then you'll get peaceful and calm. So you don't judge yourself because you really don't know what progress is. I do. I know what the progress is because I've done so many different kinds of meditation. I can recognize what's really happening. So it's a uh, interesting. Uh, I've been with people that are doing one point of concentration and they have this huge pride, you know, I'm in the fourth jhana. And they tell me that sort of thing and I go, so? 
You haven't learned anything. You're not doing the meditation in the proper way that the Buddha taught that leads to having a happier mind, that has a more balanced mind all the time. So it's a real different kind of meditation that I'm showing you and having fun is a big part of it. Now when you were in school and you had a class that you really liked, I had a, an English teacher that was amazing and he would, he, he would make every class interesting. And I got to really like it. What, what happened with my grades? Oh, I got an A. Why? Because it was fun. It wasn't work. And I understood what he was talking about. He had that, that talent to be able to explain things in a simple way. So it was fun to learn it. Well, you do you add add that to every part of your life. You make every part fun and all of a sudden you're going to be so successful you won't know what to do with it. I don't know who came along and said life is supposed to be serious. It's not. Life is supposed to be fun. The Buddha said we're the happy ones. Well, he wasn't kidding. When you follow what he's teaching and how he was teaching it, more and more precisely, it gets to be more and more fun. And I've had people that have been very, very advanced with one-pointed concentration. And they started doing this. And they would come to me with a look of wonderment on their face and they say, this really is fun. Anytime you're serious, you have an attachment. There's craving there. There's judging there. There's all kinds of suffering. But when it's fun, even though it can be painful, it's not so terrible because you're starting to change your perspective of things. You're starting to change your view. You don't do the same thing that you've been doing over and over again because you start realizing, well, that doesn't work. Why, why do I keep doing that? Why do I keep making the same mistake over and over again? So you laugh with it. And you start to say, well, this isn't so bad. It's not that big a deal. We have to make mistakes because that's how we learn. Well, that didn't work, so let's not do it that way again. But don't criticize your f because you make a mistake. Accept it as part of the learning experience. It's real important. And how does a monk not know the ford? Here a monk does not go from time to time to those monks who have learned much, who are well versed in the tradition, who maintain the Dhamma and discipline and the codes, and he does not inquire, ask questions of them. In another sutta, the Buddha said that if people don't ask questions, they will become stupid because you don't ask questions. But if you do ask questions, you're going to become very intelligent. And if you've seen any of my past uh, YouTubes, you know 
that I've, I've given the sutta a few times and I've, I've actually caused people to feel a little bit embarrassed because they don't ask questions. Okay, then be stupid. I don't care. It's your choice. And there's no such a thing as a stupid question unless you ask the same thing over and over hoping to get a different answer. So don't do that. And how is this venerable one, sir? He doesn't ask, what is the meaning of this? How do you look at it? How do you, how do you understand it? These venerable ones do not reveal to him what has not been revealed because he wasn't asked. You're not going to just give you answers and hope that you would have asked that question. No, it doesn't work that way. And that person won't clarify what's not clear or remove his doubts about the numerous things that give rise to doubts. This is how a monk does not know the ford, the stream. How does a monk not know what has been drunk? Here, when the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, a monk does not gain inspiration in the meaning, does not gain inspiration in the Dhamma, does not gain gladness connected with the Dhamma, that is how a monk does not know what it is to have drunk. Okay? And that means basically when I'm giving a Dhamma talk and you see me reading what the Buddha is saying, you're letting your mind wander. You're thinking about this, thinking about that, not paying attention. So you don't get inspired. You don't get more happiness from understanding. Now you heard me talking at lunch about this person that is putting in stuff into the Dhamma's teach or the Buddha's teaching that really shouldn't be there and there's not a great deal of uh, true understanding. And that is a problem for them. They're trying to give definitions for things that are from the dictionary, and you can't do that, not with the Buddha's teaching. It has to be from your direct practice. Now, everybody here is going to experience at least getting to the fourth jhana. Now, this is major. This is a major step in your understanding because you have direct experience. Because you're starting to understand more and more clearly how this meditation works. When I first came back from Asia, I was there for 12 years. <coughs> When I started teaching people, oh, there were so many complaints and so many judgments and so many problems because they weren't listening. Because they heard somebody else said it. Well, there's this thing called the Kalama Sutta that says you don't, you put down, aside whatever somebody else has said about Buddhism and listen to what's being said, and then you go back to the suttas and see whether it's correct or not. But you don't just sit there and criticize, oh, that's not the way this teacher taught. Well, that teacher might be teaching correctly, might not. And it has to do with blind belief in the teacher. 
Now, during the time of the Buddha, the teacher, the guru, you got you got to believe everything that he says, and that might not necessarily take you on the path that shows you how to get off of the suffering cycle. So don't just blindly believe, but when you have a practice and you're being taught correctly, you'll see the changes happening and you'll understand how this process actually does work and you're teaching yourself that. All I'm doing is giving you the information. What you do with it is up to you. Sometimes it's really amazing how many times I have to repeat myself, which you hear me do often. And they might hear something 50 or 60 times, and then it sinks in. And they go, oh, this is really amazing. It is like you said. And they come to me all happy, and they say, look at what I just found out. And it's like, well, yeah, I've been telling you that for the last six months. Don't you think if you were to listen more closely, you would actually would have had that insight? So being attentive when you're listening to the Dhamma is very, very important. Letting thoughts just kind of ramble through your mind and looking around and just not paying attention to this or that. Well, that means that you have not absorbed the Dhamma. You're just playing with it. And it takes a long time to be, get progress if you do that. So you ha your interest has to be strong. And the fun you get from learning. I have a lot of students that they tell me they get back from learning the Dhamma, the way it's being taught. And people tell them, you know, I really feel more intelligent. You, you, you sound more intelligent. You're making more sense. You're not caught up in a lot of speculation and that sort of thing. So, they want to find out more about it. What's different about you? You're, you're different now. You're more accepting. You have more balance in your mind. Well, that's the result of good meditation. And how does a monk not know the road? Here a monk does not understand the Noble Eightfold Path as it actually is. This is how a monk does not know the road. That is the path. Following that, every time you use the six R's, you are following the entire Eightfold Path at that time. You're on the right path. And your mind gets lighter. You're, you, you start having more balance in your mind. You f see and feel the difference. And how is a monk unskilled in pastures? Here a monk does not understand the four foundations of mindfulness. Now this is kind of an interesting topic because we were just talking about it today. And the translation that people are using is The first foundation is observing the body in the body. And that's a bad translation. And it leads people off of what the Buddha was talking about. It's observing the body as the body. Do you see the difference? 
This is real important. Because when you're looking in the body, that gives you more flexibility with experimenting and other things that don't work. But when you see the body as the body, as it actually is, and you see how this process actually does work, then the four foundations of mindfulness are actually talking about the jhana practice. Now people that are doing straight vipassana, they don't understand the four foundations of mindfulness very well. because of that one difference, two letters. Instead of in, it's as. And when it's as the body, then you're observing, this is the body. This is how this works. That's why you have the 32 body parts and all these other things, because now you're observing it as it is, without having other disturbances. So the feeling as feeling, mind as mind, dhammas as dhammas. So this is how there's a much deeper practice when you practice the four foundations of mindfulness the way the Buddha taught, and not change the words like that. That is how a monk is unskilled in pastures. You don't understand exactly what this field of observation is about. How does a monk milk dry? Here, when faithful householders invite a monk to take as much as he likes of robes, alms, food, resting place, and medicinal requisites, the monk does not know moderation and accepting. I've been around monks that they, oh yeah, I'll take more of that, I want more of that. And they're not moderate, they're not moderate in their taking. Now, I, when I was in Burma, I had a man come to me and he said, I want to take care of requisites for you. The, he was into vitamins and all of that kind of thing. And he said, can I get these vitamins for you? And I said, yeah. Well, what, what ones do you want and how many bottles of each one do you want? And I couldn't tell him, because that's not the monk's way. It's allowing people to give what they want to give, and let them do that without feeling like you're a burden to them. That is how a monk milks dry. Have you ever been around somebody that always asks you for stuff? Can you give me this? Can you give me that? I want that. Can, you, can I have that? Well, it gets tiresome being around a person like that. So all of a sudden, you don't, when you see them coming, you know they're going to ask you for something, and you, you go hide. Go away. Don't, don't be around somebody that has a greedy mind. And how does a monk show no extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing who have gone forth? The fathers and leaders of the Sangha. Here a monk does not maintain acts of loving kindness, both openly and privately, towards those elder monks does not maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. 
He does not maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them both openly and privately. That is how a monk shows no extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing who have long gone forth, the fathers and elders of the Sangha. So, monks that are good monks, that have long standing, you pay attention to what they're saying. You don't uh, argue with them. You don't fight with them. You don't gossip about them, because that's breaking a precept right there. And that seems to be a real problem in Asia, is gossip. They don't even understand what true gossip is. And that's perpetuating unwholesome states is basically what it boils down to. Making up stories about someone else. And that happens a lot. And they tell white lies. White lies are still lies. You don't say something that isn't true. So keeping the precepts, this is one of the most important parts of the practice. Because you've got to do it all the time. You have to keep your precepts without breaking them. If you break a precept and you come to a retreat, guess who has a lot of hindrances? Until they can purify their mind so that they don't have that problem anymore. And the meditation might be two weeks or a month or three months. And they have all of these hindrances coming up over and over and over again. And their progress is almost non-existent. Now in America, when, they, when it, Buddhism first got popular in the 60s and 70s, people would, they would take the precepts one time in a language that they didn't understand. So they got no benefit from it. And um, in the 70s, I know that there were some people that would go to retreat and they would take drugs. They would take peyote and, and mescaline and, and these kind of things. Well, what advantage do they have of doing that? They're hurting themselves. And they're breaking a precept. But they didn't see it that way. And then they wonder why, you know, I've been doing this meditation for 15 years and well, yeah, I smoke pot every now and then, and then I, I take these different kinds of drugs. And then they wonder why they can't progress. This is serious stuff. And um, all of the precepts are equally important. The reason I have you take the precepts every day in a language you understand is not just some rite and ritual just to go through and not think about. It's a reminder to keep the precepts without breaking them. If you break a precept, your meditation is going to be horrible and it's going to stay that way until you seriously take the precepts again. We'll talk more about that later. When a monk possesses these 11 qualities, he's incapable of growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because they're not following the true teachings as they should be. Monks, when a cowherd possesses 11 factors, 
He's capable of keeping and rearing a herd of cattle. What eleven? Here a cowherd has knowledge of form, and he's skilled in characteristics. He picks out the fly's eggs. He dresses wounds. He smokes out the sheds. He knows the ford. He knows what ha what it is to have drunk. He knows the road. He's skilled in pastures. He does not milk dry. And he shows extra veneration to those bulls who are fathers and leaders of the herd. When a cowherd possesses these 11 factors, he's capable of keeping and rearing a herd of cattle. So too, monks, when a monk possesses these 11 qualities, he's capable of growth, increase, and fulfillment. It's real simple. So, in this Dhamma and discipline, he follows the Dhamma and discipline closely. What eleven? Here a monk has knowledge of form. He is skilled in characteristics. He picks out the flies' eggs. He dresses the wounds. He smokes out the sheds. He knows the ford. He knows what it is to have drunk. He knows the road. He is skilled in pastures. He does not milk dry, and he shows extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing, who have long since gone forth, the fathers and elders of the Sangha. As much as I don't like the idea of becoming a father of the Sangha, I've been doing this for a lot of years. How does a monk have knowledge of form? Here a monk understands as it actually is, thus all material, all material form of whatever kind consists of the four great elements. That means you don't take it personally. And the material form derived from the four great elements. When you actually look at the body, where is it? Where is a body? A body is a concept. It's an idea. It's made up of a lot of different little parts. Head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin. And phlegm and bile and pus and all kinds of disgusting things are in the body. But where am I? When I was teaching in Malaysia, I had a lot of college students that came, and they, they were in their early 20s, and they had a lot of lust coming up, just like an early 20 person does. And they would see some beautiful body walk by, and all of a sudden they started lusting after it and really liking it. And they were concerned with that, so they asked me, what can we do about this? I said, okay, turn the body inside out. Tell me how beautiful it is. Oh, you have a great looking liver. <laughs> I've never seen such magnificent intestines. the smell of your, your pus and bile is really good. <laughs> that what it does is it, it starts showing you that's not something to be lust after it, it's something to not, not be so interested in it. 
so it's really an important part of the practice. But you only do that kind of practice with a monk. You don't do it on your own, because you'll get real disgusted and you can even become so disgusted that you would, you want to uh, get rid of the body and commit suicide. That's not a good thing. This is how a monk has knowledge of forms. How is a monk skilled in characteristics? Here a monk understands as it actually is. A fool is characterized by his actions. A wise man is characterized by his actions. A fool does things that cause themselves pain and suffering. And they kind of wallow in it and like that sort of thing. That's not healthy. But a wise man, he sees it as it actually is, so he doesn't get so involved in it, and he sees it impersonally. Now every time you use the six R's, and you let go of that tension and tightness in your head, right after that, your mind is clear. You're seeing the impersonal nature of how this process works. And you don't take it, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. You don't have those kind of things come up. The things that you have come up are the observations of how this process actually does work. That is how a monk is skilled in characteristics. And how does a monk pick, pick out flies' eggs? Here, when a thought of sensual desire has arisen, a monk does not tolerate it. He abandons it, removes it, does away with it. Now these are all descriptions that are rather harsh. It is, he relaxes and lets go of the craving for these things to arise. This is how he gets rid of it. Over a period of time, that's how it really works. When a thought of ill will or a thought of cruelty has arisen, when evil, unwholesome states have arisen, a monk does not tolerate them. He does not get caught up in it. He does not become obsessed with it. He sees how he causes himself pain by getting obsessed with it. That's how you use the six R's and you become more wholesome. And what does that mean? That means your mind is going to tend towards uplifting things on joy and happiness and, and having fun. You're going to have that more and more. That is how a monk picks out the fly's eggs. How does a monk dress wounds? Here, on seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states, of I like it or I don't like it, craving might enter his, his mind and invade his mind. So it keeps coming up over and over again. Any kind of pleasant feeling at all is just that. It is not yours. It arises because of the past work you have done to let go of craving. He practices the way of restraint. He guards the eye faculty, and that means all of the thoughts about the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, smelling an odor with the nose, tasting a flavor with the tongue, touching a tangible with body, 
on cognizing a mind object with mind or any of these other sense doors. A monk does not grasp it as signs and features. He notices things, but doesn't get caught up in it, start thinking about it. Since if he left one of these faculties unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of craving might, in, might invade his mind and remain. He practices the way of the restraint. He guards the faculties. He undertakes the restraint of the faculties. That is how a monk dresses wounds. And how is a monk smoke out the sheds? Here, a monk teaches others in detail the Dhamma that he has learned and mastered. That's what I'm doing for you right now. I'm smoking out the sheds, trying to get you to let go of past concepts and opinions that cause you suffering. And you'll see how this is done. By the end of this retreat, you will know for yourself that is how a monk smokes out the sheds. How does a monk know the ford? Here a monk goes from time to time to such monks who have learned much, who are well versed in, in the tradition, who maintain the Dhamma and discipline and the codes, and he inquires and asks questions about them. That is how, how is this, Venerable Sir? What is the meaning of this? These Venerable Ones reveal to him what has not been revealed, clarified what is not clear, and removed his doubts about the numerous things that give rise to doubt. This is how a monk knows the fords. And how does a monk know what it is to have drunk? Here, the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught. A monk gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness concerning, connected with the Dhamma. That is how a monk knows what it is to have drunk. How does a monk know the road? Here a monk understands the Eightfold Path as it actually is. That is how a monk understands the road. And how is a monk skilled in pastures? Here a monk understands the four foundations of mindfulness as they actually are. That is how a monk is skilled in pastures. And how does a monk not milk dry? Here, when a faithful householder invites a monk to take as much as he likes, of the robes, alms, food, resting place, and medicinal herbs. The monk knows moderation and accepting. That is how a monk does not milk dry. And how does a monk show extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing? who have long gone forth, the fathers and leaders of the Sangha. Here a monk maintains bodily acts of loving kindness, both openly and privately, towards those elder monks. He maintains verbal acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. 
He maintains mental acts of loving kindness toward them, both openly and privately. That is how a monk should show veneration to those elder monks. Of long standing, who have long gone forth, the fathers and leaders of the Sangha. When a monk possesses these eleven qualities, he is capable of growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this is kind of a unique kind of practice that puts things in perspective more easily for you. And it can help very much to clear up any doubts that you have that whether this is the correct path or not. And you are your own teacher. You are teaching yourself this way. Not because somebody says you have to do it that way. Not because I say you have to do it that way but by your own practice, by your own observation, by your own imperial understanding. And this is actually quite scientific. One of the reasons that I like to read the suttas is because you know that it's not coming from me. It's coming from the Buddha. And when you follow what the Buddha says, when you practice in this way, then you will be successful. It's pretty amazing how successful a lot of my students really are. Because there is this belief that uh, it's, it's impossible to t attain Nibbana in this lifetime. And I'm here to tell you it's not impossible. It, it can be very probable that you can have this sort of thing happen. How closely do you follow the directions? I'm not going to give you directions that are going to lead you off of the path. I'm going to give you suggestions that keep you on the path. But you have to decide to do it. So it's all up to you. Now this is only a 10 day retreat. Can you be successful in 10 days? Yes. I have many students that are successful in 10 days. And their understanding and the changes that they go through in just a short period of time is truly remarkable. Because they were really going for it and following the directions and seeing that it works and that gives you more confidence. And then you start trusting your own intuition. Again, trust your intuition. If you have a problem that you're going through, you don't know why, ask yourself, why is this happening now? What can I do to overcome this problem? You'll get the answer. Then you have to adjust with what it says. Okay. Good. We have people that actually ask questions this time. You're all going to be intelligent. That makes me happy. Okay, let's share some here. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.